Thank you to the music team. I appreciate always uh, your excellent work and, and uh, coming and being able to come before the Lord and sing songs to Him and to sing to one another. You know, we sing to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to encourage. We come to be together as God's people and to encourage one another. Uh, this evening at 6 till 7, one hour, I'm asking you if you would come and just spend a little time with us as we seek to equip ourselves to share the good news of Jesus. And if you think about this, who was instrumental in your life when you came to faith in Christ? Who was it that God used? Could God use you in somebody else's life to help them come to faith? And this is not something that, as I say, we're not asking you to go out and stand on a, preach, uh, on a, on a street corner and preach. We're trying to uh, see how God has uh, formed and made each one of us and how we can uh, share uh, his, his goodness and grace and love through our personality and through who we are. Uh, so six till seven, downstairs in the lower level. You know, a significant and critical featuring, uh, feature of our gathering uh, is... Uh, the preaching of the Word of God. I want to talk about that this morning for a few minutes. Um, we commit a significant amount of time to preaching the Word of God. And some of you are thinking, yeah, it's more than just significant. It's a lot. Uh, we'll just stop that. And you guys over here, too. Uh, it's a time when we collectively bring ourselves to sit under the word of God, to listen to it being proclaimed and, uh, and understood, and to submit ourselves to that authority. And while everything that we do is important, and I just, I gotta tell you, music team, I just, God just used you this morning f uh, uh, to give me a voice to praise the Lord in such a wonderful way. Um, well, there's a lot of good things we do. The declaration of the word of God must be primary in what we do. And we need to give our attention to it. Now, it's interesting because uh, we've just spent over the last two months a time talking about one of Jesus' sermons. Can I say to you that if we really weren't tiptoeing through this, we could do six months, no problem, on the Sermon on the Mount, looking at the different aspects of it. Um, and and uh, preaching was really important to Jesus. In fact, of all the things that he did, his preaching and teaching ministry was primary for him. He was the master preacher. He was the master teacher. And uh, when he launched his ministry uh, in, in Matthew chapter 4, before the Sermon on the Mount, it said, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. His ministry was that of preaching. A few verses later in verse 23, Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Primary was his ministry uh, of preaching and teaching. Uh, now, it's interesting, uh, and, and here's why I say that, that there's, a primary, uh, there's a primacy of the preaching ministry. Um, I, as I said, I loved our music, and our music is a critical part of our gathering and what we do in singing to God and singing to one another and giving and, and fellowshipping and all of those kind of things. But here's what, here's what it was said of Jesus. Um, he had gone and, as he often did, would steal away into a quiet place by himself and would commune with the Father. And people went looking for him. And uh, Jesus said, they want to they wanna talk to you. The, the crowds are looking for you. Jesus said, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I've come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Uh, interesting that 97% of the, the statements on what 
what uh, uh, moved uh, Jesus to, to what he did, what was a priority for him, 97% of those things were the preaching ministry. It was central to what he did. In fact, some of you snickering this morning about how long the sermon is here. I tell you, you need to go to Russia or some of these places where they can go for two and three hours. Uh, but here's, uh, here's what happened. Jesus had gone out and had preached. And uh, he said this, I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat, which led to the feeding of the 5,000. He said uh, that preaching went on and on and on, and he said, I can't even send them away. I got to do a miracle to provide for their physical needs. And so while we don't minimize healing and miracles and deliverance from demons and, and all of the other things we do, primary for Jesus was the teaching and preaching ministry. And it's no uh, coincidence that that should be important in the church as well, the importance of preaching. The Apostle Paul would say to Timothy as he left him in Ephesus to take care of the church there, he said, look at Timothy, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Paul would say to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians uh, 1, uh, he said, for since the wisdom uh, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. In the wisdom of the world, they didn't know, they didn't know God. God was pleased, listen, through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Central and core to it was the teaching and preaching ministry. And, and, and we may want to replace a lot of things in church life today, but, but you don't want to replace preaching the word of God. And it was through the fool of what people consider foolish and nonsense. That's what God used uh, to bring people to faith in Jesus. Central as w uh, to what we do as a church is the preaching and teaching ministry. Uh, he said uh, in, the, in the end of Mark, Jesus said this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And what is the word of God? The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. He talked about the power of the word of God when it's unleashed in, and uh, the Spirit of God takes it and does what he wants. Well, I want to talk to you just for a few minutes uh, about the anatomy of a sermon. Well, what is preaching? The word uh, for, for preaching is a word that means to herald, uh, to uh, declare, uh, to be a spokesman for someone else. Uh, that in this case, to be a spokesman for our king, to proclaim a message from him. That the message is not the preacher's own uh, contrivance. It's not something that he made up. He's just to be faithfully transmitting God's word to the people. And uh, the preacher is to bring that message uh, accurately and faithfully. Now, a couple weeks ago, we mentioned this. We mentioned in, in James 3 that it said, don't presume to be many teachers knowing that you will be judged more strictly. Do you remember we talked that when we were talking about judgment? And I, I want you to know that to stand up here and to represent God and to proclaim his word to you is, is something that I hold with great reverence and fear and, and respect uh, because I will be judged for what I do with the word of God in representing that word of God. And, and you need to pray for us who preach that God will protect us and guide us, that we would speak his truth in, in an accurate and in, in, uh, in, uh, in the power of the spirit. So uh, when, when in, the preaching, uh, in the preaching discipline, uh, 
The preacher has to have something to preach, so he's praying, he's asking God to lead him in what the people of God need, how they need to be fed, what they need to be, uh, uh, to know, and, and, and then he needs to begin to study that word, to pray and ask God to open his heart, open his understanding as he studies uh, the word of God. It's interesting, uh, quite a number of years ago, I had a, a woman say to me, how long does it take you to do a sermon? Like 30 minutes, 45 minutes? And I'm going like, really? That's what you, that's what you think? You could whip that off in 30 minutes. What, what the preacher is called to do is to get into the word of God and begin to study it and study it in depth, to ask the spirit to reveal to him the, un, the understanding uh, of what is being say, said and what it means. It, it's to study other passages. It, it's to... Uh, uh, look and coordinate the passages and topics. Uh, sometimes it involves uh, studying and looking and, and searching through the original languages if, if uh, a person has had the, the privilege and honor of studying the biblical languages. And, and studying the heart of the, piece, the, uh, the preachers to be opened and, and allowing God to take that and, and to drive it home in his heart. So when, when the preacher spends time in, uh, in, in study, he is, if he has integrity, he's saying, God, what does this mean to me? What do I need to change in my life? What is it that I need to do so that I'm living it out, so that it has integrity, so that when I'm speaking, I'm speaking with your authority because I'm seeking to honor your word in my own life. It's not, uh, do as I say, not as I do. To have integrity, there needs to be that sense of I bring myself into subjection and to submit myself to the word of God and allow it to shape my life. The preacher's heart must be open. It must first find itself to be laid bare before God and his word and allow it to permeate his soul or her soul. Convict, uh, convict where necessary, encourage, comfort, uh, and to deal with sin in the preacher's life, to understand um, and, and fear God and confess what needs to be confessed, to allow God to do his work and to have integrity. Then the preacher needs to also understand the, the people he's speaking with because he needs to understand first what the, what the, what the scripture meant to the original audience, and then he needs to fast forward to who we are and what we deal with and what we struggle with. And, and at that point, uh, we need to understand what the needs are so that we can bring that word to God's people. And um, as we do that, we need to answer a question, not only what does the text mean, but what does it mean to us today? What is God asking me to do? And it can be challenging what God has to say uh, many times it's not palatable. Uh, sometimes it's with fear and trepidation that I stand before you and I, and I say, look, at I, you're not gonna like this. I need to, I need to give you God's word. Here, here it is, straight up. And, and I need to share that with you. It can be challenging. Um, and, and, and times it takes courage. And uh, we might offend your sensibilities. We may rub you the wrong way. And uh, frankly, I gotta tell you, I'd rather have you mad at me, then God mad at me. And, and I need to have that uh, uh, desire to honor him and be true to him. The Apostle Paul would say in Acts 20, he said um, in his farewell address to the Ephesian elders, I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. I didn't hold anything back. Uh, there are times when I'm saying, oh, Lord, I, I don't want to preach that. That's too hard. It's too difficult. And, and, and Paul said, in, in I, I did this, I didn't hold anything back. And, and he didn't deliver it in, in a cold, dispassionate, uncaring manner. It broke his heart many times, and he wept as he shared and as he prepared. Again, in, in Acts 20, he says to the same group of people, I serve the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plot of the Jews. You know I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be of help to you. 
He was deeply invested. He was passionately invested. He was emotionally invested. This wasn't just, uh, I'm gonna go through some cognitive process and tell you what the Bible says. It was something that had gripped his own soul. I mean, he he thought about the people he was speaking to. He thought about his own people, the Jews, and and he wept over them and and, uh, their rejection of Christ. So a question must be asked, so what? Here you've read and you've expounded the Bible to us, so what? Well, there's a cognitive aspect, as we said, to speak uh, to the mind, God's truth that shapes our beliefs and, uh, and uh, our thinking and our rationale, but it also needs to touch our emotion at some point. When you, when you understand what, who God is, and, and, and I, I gotta tell you, through a couple of the songs here, I was fighting back tears this morning, just overwhelmed by who God is and what, he, and what he's done for us and how wonderfully great he is. Uh, and so there's an emotional response. There should be an emotional response to the truth of God's word, not emotion, before everything else, emotion in response to what God says. But it's not just what did I learn, and it's not just how do I feel. It's also, it also must include what does God want me to do? There's a volitional aspect. Randy Pope talked about preaching, and he said this, preaching is talking to people about themselves from the Bible. Do you like that? Preaching is talking to people about themselves from the Bible. Andy Stanley would say that the, uh, the goal of preaching is this, to teach people how to live a life that reflects val- the values, principles, and truths of the Bible. How to live it out, how to live it out. The goal for preaching, listen to this, is a changed life. Anything less than that is missing the point of preaching. The point of preaching is this, that God would touch my life and change it and bring it into conformity with his will. Therefore, we are instructed uh, and encouraged, and uh, we may feel good, but that comes up short. We've got to, we've got to uh, uh, do what God is saying to do. Now, there's a, what we've been looking at is a sermon from Jesus, a sermon that he preached that we've spent over two months looking at. And uh, Jesus is going to wrap the sermon up now. <laughs> sometimes sometimes uh, pastors don't have a lot of credibility. In conclusion, and then he went 15 minutes more. Uh, to sum up, you know. So, but Jesus is doing his own conclusion. Jesus is, he's wrapping it up. And uh, in, in chapter 7 through the, uh, verse 13 through the end of the chapter is the conclusion. He's going to invite his lit- listeners uh, to consider and make some changes in their lives. He's, he's going for life application. He's going to contrast the, uh, the choices with a call to make the right choice. And, and so, um, as we f- read his sermon, we want to ask God, what is it that you want me to do with this? Not what do I need to know, not what do I need to feel, but what do I, what do I need to do with this? And he's going to contrast in several things, one thing against another, and show us the choices that we need to make. Well, first he talks about two ways. There are two ways. Life is at a crossroad, and we have to make a decision. There are two ways we can go. And so Jesus says this, enter through the narrow gate, For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. As he wraps up the sermon of all the things that he said to do, he he said this, you need to enter through the narrow gate. He's on a journey, and that journey brings him to two paths that are very different. First, there are two gates. That's the entrance into the way. And one gate is narrow. It's hard to get through. You can't take anything with you. It's, it's like you can just get yourself through that gate. But there's a, a, a broad entrance as well. Uh, the, 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 the small entrance is, is a little bit obscure. It's not so obvious. The other one is very apparent. The narrow gate is restrictive. 
we consider something narrow, he's very narrow-minded as bad. But for Jesus, this narrow entrance was something that was very good and appropriate. Those who go to the narrow can't take anything with them but themselves. They're the poor in spirit. They're the humble. They're the ones that enter in through that. And this leads to two roads. There's a narrow road and a broad road. Uh, one of them calls for discipline and submission. The other's easy. The other is broad. It has few demands it'll put on you. It invites you to come. To, uh, it's not narrow and restricting and demanding. It just lets you do your thing. And there are two crowds. One is not popular. That narrow way uh, that you can only slip by is not popular. But there are a lot of people on this broad way. Uh, and, and here they are. They, they seem to be having a good time. It's easy. It's, in, it's, uh, it's convenient. It's not encumbered by a lot of rules and regulations. You can do whatever you want to do. And there are two crowds. One is not so popular. And the other one is the place to be. And it's the place to be with. And everybody's choosing it. At least it seems that way. And, and it's the fun life. It's the, the good life. And the narrow way with Jesus that he was talking about is not the same way, but there are two destinies also. One is life, and one is death. It, it, it didn't look like that burdensome. When, when, you, when you went on that narrow path, it led to life. But the, the broad way where everybody seemed to be going and, and it seemed easy and, and self-gratifying and all the rest of that, that's a place of death. Choose to enter at the narrow gate. Go in that narrow way. Don't follow the crowd because in the end it's destruction. But if you'll go in the narrow gate, you'll have life. In Deuteronomy 30 in verse 19 it says this, the Lord says, I've set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Now choose life. And every one of us has a decision to make. We're going to choose which way we're going to go. We're ju we'll choose which path. And you can't avoid making a choice. You say, well, I'm not ready to make a choice. Okay, that's fine. But in not making a choice, you've made a choice. Uh, you, you can either go one way or the other. In John chapter 3 and 36, it says this, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And whoever rejects the Son shall not see life, but God's wrath remains on him. You, you can't say, well, you know, I, I'm intrigued by this, but I, I, you know, it's not a point in my life that I want to do this. I've got some things I want to live for and do, and... And God, uh, going God's way would cramp my style a bit, so I am really not interested in this. And God calls us to respond. And Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. He pleads with them. That's the way to go. It's not popular, but that's where blessing will be. Well, he goes on and he talks about two trees. And there are two roads, and now two ways, and now two trees. And Jesus warns us of false teachers. He says, as you go on this journey of faith, uh, you've got to watch out that there are people who will seek to undermine your faith and, and give you things that are not right and would contradict what Jesus said. Um, and there'd be no narrow gate or way there. And so he says this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're like ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you'll recognize them. Do people pick grapes from a thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. He said this, when, when you follow Christ, they're going to be people who have wrong teaching. They're going to lead you in a wrong path. They're going to send you in a wrong direction. And you need to know, and you need to be discerning, and you need to have good judgment. Not judgmentalism, like we talked about two weeks, but good judgment and understanding. Uh, and, and things can look good on the outside, 
Uh, but here, here are these guys that are dressed up in sheep's clothing, but what they really are is they're ferocious wolves, and they'll tear you to, part, uh, to pieces. And you look at it, and, and you, you're not sure what. And he says, you, you need to check the fruit, because a good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. You've got to be a, a you've got to detect what it is. And, and so this re reality is of masking the identity, unmasking the, of these ferocious wolves and going in God's way. And they can impress the crowd. They can wow them. They can win their confidence, but they're evil and they're destructive. And in the end, uh, they'll be thrown into the fire. Uh, they'll be destroyed. So there's a call, beware, critically evaluate how do you spot and identify that? You look at the fruit. You look at the fruit. What is the fruit? The fruit is how a person lives, what they say, what they do, how they think. And as you get close to them and as you hear them, can you spot and identify? Yeah, there's, you can identify who is right and who's wrong in this case. Examine their lives in the light of Jesus' teaching. He's just given us a sermon by which we can measure other people. In 1 John 4, it says, test the spirits to see if they're from God. I had to tell you, I see ministries on TV sometime, and I hear the teaching and where they're going, and I, I shake my head. And some of, you, some of you may be watching some of these people and not even realize how harmful and how wrong it is. Uh, because it can look big, and it can look impressive, and it can look successful, and, and so much uh, is available, but it can be deceptive. Uh, and, and leaders uh, are called to protect the flock from the wolves. Um, a, a number of years ago, uh, there was a couple uh, with a daughter, and uh, she was invited. Uh, she was, uh, uh, I'm just sorry, I just lost my, my train here. Let me come back to this. Uh, the thing is, um, a person was um, impressed by things she saw. And we had, we had somebody come in, before I was at one of the churches I served at, there was a, a, a person who had come into the church and won over the hearts of the people. And uh, he was uh, very, uh, uh, very well-spoken. In fact, they had him preaching quite often. And he had, uh, he had won the hearts of the people until the RCMP came one day, and he had come from the States. The woman he was with was not his wife, and her daughter was the woman's daughter. And everything he was doing and saying was a sham. And uh, they came, and they got the guy, and he went to prison. But uh, it was so deceptive. And we need to be able to test and understand the jig was up for him. By your fruit, you'll know them. There's no good fruit, no judgment. And uh, you throw those bad branches and bad trees into the, uh, into the fire. Well, there are also two claims. And this is kind of a tough one, too. Another concern is not only to be able to spot uh, wrong and heresy and, and things are not of God in other people. It's another thing to understand it in your own life. And so there are two claims in this passage. Uh, one is a warning against self-deception. He says this, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So he, somebody is, is, is saying, Lord, Lord, and Jesus said, not everyone who makes that confession is mine. In fact, uh, they will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's only the one who does the will of my Father. He says this, many of you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Didn't we do that? Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Prophesying, speaking on behalf of God, uh, people who are doing miracles, 
people who are driving out demons, and we go, well, it has to be of God with, with that, does it? Do you remember when Moses went and, uh, before Pharaoh, and Moses cast down his staff on the ground, and it turned into a snake, remember? Do you remember what the magicians in Egypt did? They threw down theirs, and it became a snake too. And sometimes we look and we, we see things that look spectacular, and we go, oh, that's gotta be of God. But it's not of God. It's not all of God. And uh, he goes on to say this, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you, over, uh, you uh, uh, evildoers. God is saying here, you've got to be careful and look at yourself. Yeah, Lord, Lord, I mean, yeah, we're buddies. You know me, it's Kevin. I've done all kinds of this stuff for you. I've done this, that, and the other thing for you. And he says, depart from me. I never knew you. I never knew you. And so there can be subtlety inside when we're trapped and caught by something else and, and uh, we we're, we're have no part in God and uh, we're imposters. It's a chilling indictment that sacred things can come that, that are, are disrupted, and he can say, I never knew you. A verbal testimony without action, it will never do. These are people who talk a good talk. Uh, look at what I've done. Uh, look, at, look at who I am. And, and he says, that won't do it. What will do it is the people who do what I say. And so examine your faith. The Apostle Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Test yourself. Make sure that you're walking with God. Well, he has then two builders. Two builders. Uh, and uh, in this, he's going to sum up the message and call for a response. What is God looking for? When, when the word of God is proclaimed, he's looking for a response. And here there were two builders. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. What, what did they do? They heard it and they put it into action. They did it. They obeyed it. But, not, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Here are two people building a house. They're both hearing the same message. They both have the same message. They both, uh, they both respond by building houses. They, they could have easily uh, built identical houses. And yet, here's what happens. One is, one is founded on the rock, on something solid. The other's on sand, and, and uh, they can have, uh, in, in the Holy Land, they can have these flash floods that come up and fill these dry wadis with with uh, rain and, and it could just sweep things away. And here is a guy who built on sand and everything just went. And he watched his house destroyed before him. And what was the difference? This is a guy who heard and did nothing about it. And, and the guy who, whose house stood, listened and put it into practice. Contrasting these two builders. Same message, same thing. The difference was obedience. It was doing what God had said. And no obedience, you're fooling yourself. If you can sit week after week after week and listen to the word of God, and God is directing you to do something, and you're going, nah, it's, nah, I'm, not, I'm not doing that, that you've missed the point, And you may be fooling yourself. He's calling for us to make a decision. Make a decision. Week after week, we're confronted with that. And um, it's interesting, the very final words that Jesus speaks in uh, Matthew's gospel, after he is resurrected, he says this, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, to do, to practice, to put into practice what I'm saying. And and so our challenge as a church is this. It's our our challenge is this. Uh, Our mission is to lead people to know Jesus Christ and to follow him passionately, passionately. And Jesus says, "Here's here's what I want you to do. You do this until I come back. You you make disciples, followers. And as we put in our our mission statement, passionate followers, people who are engaged with heart and and mind and committed to him. Uh, we We will obey him. And and Jesus is looking for that in us. And and here we come week after week. He's looking for obedience. He's looking to put put faith into action. In James 2, it says, faith without deeds is dead. If if you've got a faith, but you're not doing, you're not living, it's not engaging your will, there's something wrong. I know I talked with a couple uh, who who were getting married. And... um, the gal had a, a history in faith and in the church, and the guy that she was marrying did not have. And I, I talked to them and uh, explained the gospel, and this guy said he believed that. He was, he was a believer. Their marriage would end a few years later, and uh, he said, I did what I had to do to get the girl. I did what I had to do to get the girl. God called for one thing. He said, watch out, evaluate the fruit, look, look at the fruit of their life. But that wasn't what happened with them. God's plan is to work in our lives through the word of God being applied. Don't be deceived. Our commitment is, is to that. Now, one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is we've worked on some of the statements of our church And uh, one of those was uh, statements of five core values. And I want to show you, um, uh, I want to show you one of those. Or maybe not. Let me read it to you. One of our core values is this biblical teaching and preaching. We believe that life transformation happens through the spirit-filled communication of the Bible. We are committed to preaching and teaching the word of God with integrity, without compromise, and in a way that speaks to the relevant issues of our time, with love and compassion. The Bible is central to all we do at Unionville Alliance Church. That's what we do, and when we give this time. And, and, and we come here week after week after week and ask God to speak to us and ask God to open our hearts and to reveal to us his truth so that we understand it and we understand how we apply it as well. The life groups that we do are focused on this. It's designed to be heavily uh, applicational. Um, I gotta tell you, there was a, uh, there was a group of men that would meet for a, a Bible study. Older guys, and they were all fairly mature in the faith and they would get together and they would grab a hold of some theological issue and they would just like dogs on a piece of meat all of them trying to get a piece of it and uh, and they would they would go through and it would get quite loud sometimes and they're this guy's on this view and this guy has this view and this guy has this view and and they're going at it and I, I, I had to say to these guys what is your experience in the word doing to change your life, to make you more like Jesus Christ? Because the whole poor purpose of this is to become like Jesus Christ, and it wasn't. Now, I, can't, I gotta tell you, I love a good debate sometimes over theological issues and, and to get into it and to tag in with something, but that's not what necessarily does something to change my heart and change my life. God wants to change me. And uh, he wants me to submit myself to the word of God. And so week after week after week, the scripture is open and God is asking us to choose, to make a decision. 
when he says, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to be. Now we're confronted with, are we going to be hearers only and go out and not be changed? Or are we going to do that? Are we, do, when we look, as James says, look into the perfect law of liberty, and we see who we are in it, and we see what's wrong with us, and we go away and we forget what we looked like. That's not. And, and, and so what we do is week after week, if you will come seriously with an open heart asking God to reveal to you what, what he is saying and what it means to you, you will grow in wonderful ways. We had a baptismal service last week, and um, it was so great, and, and there are people, I, I'm sure, in a church the size of ours who haven't been baptized yet, but you are believers, and I want to put out before you. Jesus said, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded. And you may be saying, well, you know, it's been so long and I never did do it and I, you know, I feel a little awkward now or I feel a little shy about it. Or, and I'm saying, you have a choice to make. Am I going to obey God or am I not going to obey God? Will I do what God says? And as we went through and Pastor Daniel gave us that whole list of things that Jesus had in the sermon... And if you look through all those and say, all right, you know, God is talking to me about this issue in my life. I need to do something about it. And, and uh, week after week, we're called to respond and to apply the word of God to our life. Now, there's, uh, there's a response here. Uh, when, when Jesus had finished his sermon... We read this. When he'd finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. They would say, you know, uh, Rabbi Ben Eleazar, he says this, and this rabbi says this, and Jesus said, you have heard it said, I say unto you, he spoke with authority. He, he, they were in rapt attention. Here they are three days listening to Jesus preach. You guys have trouble 40 minutes with me, and I realize I'm not Jesus. But uh, um, it, it, was, it was gripped their heart. But how many of those people went away from that and said, man, that was fantastic. Could you believe what he said and how he taught? And, and man, it was, it was gripping. He had his grip. But how do you go away from that experience? Uh, they went, obviously some of them, would have made commitment. And some of them say, well, that was fantastic. I've never heard anything like that, but it didn't touch their life at all. And, and our thing is this, that, that we want God to speak and to obey. I remember we had a La Laotian family in one of the churches I pastored. And the mother told me afterwards, it, she had two, two or three kids, but one little kid said to his, his brother, shh, God is speaking, meaning me. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we, we laugh at that in a way, but somebody's representing the word of God. And my role is to hide behind the scripture and to proclaim God so that when, when we stand and we deliver the word of God, it's God speaking. And we say, yes. I will. In Nehemiah chapter 8, and you look at this passage in your life groups, Ezra, the scribe, they build a, they build a big uh, platform, and he stands and reads the word of God. And when he stood to read the word of God, uh, the people bowed and put their faces on the ground, and they said, Amen, Amen, and lifted their hands to him. And as we gather week by week, we can do business with God or we can put in time because, you know, a Christian's supposed to do this and I want to keep God off my back so I'll go to church semi-regularly or something like that. No, uh, when we come, we come to hear God speak and to say, yes, yes, amen, amen. And that is my prayer for us. I can tell you that God will grow us in ways that you cannot imagine when we take seriously his word and we say, yes, yes. Because every time we come, we're confronted with decisions. It's gonna be God's way or our way. 
And my prayer is that we will walk with him and uh, that he will grow us in, a, in fantastic ways. Father, here we are, your children. Here we are before your throne, singing songs to you and listening to your word. Your word is so challenging. It's so beautiful, but it's so challenging. And we know that we can't do it in our own strength. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And so even as we were reminded last week uh, to knock and to ask and to seek and to have God himself help us through the Holy Spirit to be everything he wants us to be. Father, may our hearts be attuned to you and to your word. As, we, as you speak to us, may we say yes. And may we see what you want, and that is lives that are transformed to be like Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.